uh, take your copy of the Word of God this evening and open it to Psalm 119, where we have come tonight to message number 10 in this study of Psalm 119, um, longest chapter in the Bible, I believe 176 verses in Psalm 119. And so tonight we are coming to the Hebrew letter Yod, Psalm 119, verses 73 through 80. And so uh, as you're turning there, let me ask you, what do you do in your life? How do you react when the going gets tough, when the way gets hard, when the trials come, when the problems begin to pile up? How do you react to that? What do you do? You know, sometimes if we're not real careful, we have a tendency to start pouting. To kind of throw a little pity party among ourselves, get other people involved in it maybe. Sometimes we start sulking and souring, focusing all the adversity that we might have around us. Sometimes we get mad. Maybe even get mad at God. God, why have you allowed all these things to happen to me? Sometimes we just shut down. We just kind of stop operating. We just kind of basically start existing. None of those are the ways that God wants us to respond when the going begins to get tough in our life. We know our reactions often are usually less than desirable. And sadly, they're often very ungodly. The psalmist, and we believe Psalm 119, perhaps the author was, in fact, David. If it was a man well acquainted with suffering... Thankfully, we'll see here tonight in the text that he took a different approach to suffering, to adversity. And I think that we can learn from his example this evening as, again, he's focusing on the Word of God. Let me read it for us there. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 73. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to your word, to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood but I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. We're reading the words of a man right there tonight who knew something about affliction and adversity. And I think there's several things that you and I can see there. Number one, let me encourage you tonight. When the going gets tough, ask God for a deeper understanding of His Word. When you're going, when your way gets tough, ask God for a deeper understanding of His Word. Look how he begins here in verse 73. The man is going through a hard time. We don't know probably exactly what it all is. We know what he went through with Saul even before he became King David. So if this is in fact David, a man that was very well acquainted with suffering. But he says there in verse 73, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of who our Creator is. Often we need to remind ourselves of who our God is. When you and I begin to think that maybe God doesn't know what He's doing, when He doesn't see what we're going through, keep in mind that He was the one that put you together. Keep in mind that He was the one that decreed it that your life would come into existence. Keep in mind that the Scripture says, the psalmist said, Lord, you saw me and my mother's womb in in, in her inmost parts Lord you saw me God knew you before you ever even were conceived in your mother's womb and so I think it's just important when we're going through adversity and hard times like the psalmist says here Lord your hands have made me and fashioned me you know everything you knew me when I was nothing and by virtue of that he says in verse 73 give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. I think in essence what he's saying is, Lord, you knew me when I was nothing. You made me. You fashioned me. You're the one who put me together, which, by the way, that speaks against evolution, does it not? We didn't just come out of here by natural selection, survival of the fittest, chance. We got here because God intends for us to be here and decreed that you and I would be here. 
He has all understanding. He knows everything. And so the psalmist reminds himself, look, I didn't make all this. Lord, you made all this. It's kind of like the Bible says in Isaiah 40. Has God ever needed a counselor? Has God ever needed to seek wisdom from anybody else? He doesn't need a self-help book. He knows everything. And the psalmist just had to remind himself, sometimes we get so caught up in our stuff that we forget how big God is. He's the awesome creator of heaven and earth. And He's the one who intended every single one of us to be here and put every one of us here and knit us together inside our mother's womb. That is to say, He knows everything there is to know and He knows everything about you. Who better to go to for understanding than the one who knows everything there is to know. And so his prayer is one that you and I need to emulate. Lord, give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. I'm going through this hard time. I'm going through this adversity. What do I need more than anything else when I'm going through trials and adversity? I need truth. I need the truth of the Lord because the reality is that the Bible says in John chapter 8 that our adversary, the devil, is not just a liar... But the Bible says in John 8, 44, He's the father of lies. He will deceive you. He will trick you into thinking that God doesn't love you, He's forgotten about you, and that He just wants to torture you and He wants you to be in pain. And when you and I are not where we need to be with the Lord, when we're not reminding ourselves of the truth of the Word of God, we can be misled by the lies of the devil. So when you and I are going through a hard time, we need to double down on the Word of God. And pray, Lord, show me even greater truths. Show me even greater depths that when I go through these hard times, Lord, I'll be fastened to the bedrock of your word so that I'll not be blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine and every thought and every lie that the devil wants to come and send against me. When you're going through a hard time, if you're going through a hard time today, ask God to give you a deeper understanding of his word. It will comfort your heart and your mind. Number two, I encourage you tonight, if you're going through a difficult time, place your hope in all that God has promised. Place your hope in everything that God has promised. In verse 74, what does he say? Lord, those who fear you will be glad when they see me. How many of y'all know not everybody is glad to see you? (laughs) We wish that wasn't the case, but it is. Everybody ain't glad to see you. But if you love the Lord, and you love the Word of God, and you love the people of God, and you want to worship and be a part of the body of Christ, probably the people of God want to be with you. If if you desire to edify the church and build up your brother in Christ, probably your brothers and sisters in Christ want to be with you. And so God help us, by the way, to be the kind of people that other people actually want to be with. That Christ followers actually want to be with. Those who fear you, Lord, will be glad when they see me. Because, by the way, we're bound together by the Holy Spirit. We're part of the same family. I know we were all probably born into different families. But when you were born again, you were born into the family of God. You were adopted into the family of God. You want to be with your brothers and sisters? Don't answer that question out loud. (laughs) Generally speaking... We enjoy being with our family. We enjoy being with our brothers and sisters. How much the more should we enjoy being and want to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Lord, those who fear you, let them be glad when they see me. And then he says, because I have hoped in your word. They should desire to be with me because, Lord, just like them, I've I've placed my confidence in you. I've placed my confidence in your word. Ask yourself tonight, What have you placed your hope and your trust in? What have you placed your confidence in? You know why so many people are miserable in the world today? Because they place their hope in a political leader. Because they place their hope in the economy. Because they place their hope in their plans and their dreams and their jobs and their schemes. And when all those things didn't go like they wanted them to go, well then guess what? You're miserable. You'll be miserable if you place your hope, your bedrock hope and trust, if you place it in anything other than God and His Word. 
you're going to be disappointed. Place your hope in everything that God has promised. When you're going through a hard time, when it feels like you may not come out on the other side, when you feel like you're not going to have the strength to endure the trial that you're going through, you can remind yourself, the Bible says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you're distressed because you feel like that all your needs are not going to be met, you're not going to be able to meet all your obligations, remember Paul said in that same passage, my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When I'm going through hard times, I want to get into the Scripture. Because this is our hope as followers of Christ. If God has said it, it's true. Doesn't matter what your circumstances, doesn't matter what you see in front of you. If God has said it, it's true. And that's our hope. When you're going through a hard time, make sure that you place your hope in everything that God has promised. I probably told you this before, but one of the best gifts I was ever given when I graduated high school, I had this little lady in the church and she came up and she brought me this little book and I think they still have them. The cover of it said, Promise Book for Graduates. And you know what it was? It was topical. It might be about like trust, worry, fear, um, provision, topical. And for all these topics, there was probably maybe 75 or 100 topics in there. For every single one, there was probably at least five or six passages of Scripture that dealt with every single one. So you know what I started doing? I started taking all of those promises in my Bible, and I started underlining them in red in my copy of the Word of God. And then the Holy Spirit moved on me to say, start memorizing those. It's the best thing anybody could have ever done for me was put me in touch with the promises of God. Because as I've gone through life and ministry, and I bet you have the same testimony as well, when things begin to crumble and falter and things don't go like you want them to go, you can always hold on to the bedrock of the Word of God. That's where our hope is. Number three, let me encourage you. If you're going through a hard time, remember that God has a purpose for your pain. Let me say that again. Remember that God has a purpose for your pain. You ever wonder why you're going through what you're going through? Psalmist says there, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right. Whatever God does is right. You've got to trust in that. You've got to believe that. Even when you can't seem to understand what God is doing, you've got to know, you've got to be convinced that all that God does is right. Because God is perfect in all of His ways. He's convinced of that. So He says, Lord, I know that your judgments are right. And that in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. See, we think God is being faithful to us when He provides all of our needs. We think God's being faithful to us when He provides us the strength to overcome every trial. We think God's being faithful to us when we don't have a single problem in our lives. Have you ever thought that maybe the faithfulness of God is being demonstrated in your affliction? Now this takes some spiritual maturity to begin to understand. But he says, Lord, it's in faithfulness that you have afflicted me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were serving the Lord. They were living for God. And what did God do to them? He caused them to be apprehended, arrested, and finally tossed into a fiery furnace. That's a trial. But have you ever thought in the midst of that trial how God was using that to demonstrate His faithfulness to them? If they had never been thrown into that fire, the fourth man would have never showed up. I didn't even think about that till right now. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. If they had never been thrown in that furnace, the fourth man would have never shown up. Maybe the reason God puts you in your trial, in your affliction, is so the fourth man could show up. Remember who the fourth man was? I see one like unto the Son of God, Nebuchadnezzar said. Maybe you're walking through the valley right now because Jesus wants to show up. And God wants to reveal His faithfulness to you. Don't get discouraged. Don't grow weary. 
We said in the last point that we need to place our trust and our confidence, our hope in everything that God has promised. Well, one of those great promises that I have come to probably day after day after day is Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good to those that love Him and are the called according to His purpose. If you've been called to salvation, if you've answered that call, you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're inhabited by the Holy Spirit, you can claim that promise. Now, unbelievers can't claim that promise. But those that have placed their faith in Christ can claim the promise that there's not a thing that happens in your life that God cannot take that and use that for your good and His glory. Hold on to that. God has a purpose for your pain. You may not even know what it is yet. I can look back in my life, the worst, hardest times I had in my life, I didn't understand what was going on when I was in the midst of those times. But I can look back on it now, and I can see so clearly what God was doing. You can too. He's got a purpose for your pain. Don't give up on God. Number four. You're going through a hard time, you need to pray for God to grant you His tender mercies. Ask God to give you His mercy, verses 76 through 77. The psalmist says, let I pray your merciful kindness. In Hebrew, that's kesed, the tender kindness, the tender mercy and love of God. Let your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. He's taking God at His word. And then he says, let your tender mercies Come to me that I may live. Listen, just because God can take your pain and use it for a purpose and use it for His glory doesn't mean that in the midst of your trial and your pain you can't ask for the mercy of God. You and I ought to be asking for the mercy of God. If God doesn't intend for you to have the fullness of His mercy right now, then He'll show you that. But there's not one reason that you and I cannot come and ask God for alleviation of our pain and our suffering and our hurt, asking for the mercies of God. You know, the Bible says, where is it in 1 John? That we come and we lay all of our request, we lay all of our anxiety upon Him, 1 Peter chapter 5, because He cares for us. It doesn't matter what it is. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that you can ask God for anything. You can come to God and you can ask God for anything. And if what you've asked is consistent with His will for your life, the Bible says you have the things for which you have asked. You know, part of the problem for us sometimes as Christ followers is that we ask for the wrong things. There was a song came out many years ago that said, I thank God for unanswered prayers. Well, God, I think the more accurate way to say that, you know, God answers our prayers. Usually it's with yes, no, or wait. That's typically what I've experienced. I think the better way to say that is I thank God that God did not grant all my requests. If God had granted all the requests that I've made, I'd probably be in a mess right now. Not everything, see, that I've asked, probably the majority of things that I've asked over the course of my life were not consistent with the will of God. And when they weren't, God did not grant those things. And even in that, God shows His mercy to us. The Bible says in James chapter 4, You have not because you ask not. And then he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. You're not asking for the right thing because what you're asking for, what you want to do is take that and spend that on your sensual pleasure, James says. Instead, you and I need to line ourselves up more in line with the will of God for our life. But there's not a thing wrong with you, brother or sister in Christ, praying for the mercy of God in the midst of your trial. God loves to show mercy. He's done it over and over. He'll do it for you too. Cry out and ask for the mercy of God in your situation. Number five, you're going through a hard time. Delight yourself in His Word by meditating on His truth. Delight yourself in His Word by meditating upon His truth. Verses 77 and 78, a couple of concepts combined here, but it all goes together nicely. He says, Lord, for your law is my delight. I delight myself in the law of God. I mean, what do you really delight yourself in? What do we as humans tend to delight ourselves in? Taking a vacation? <laughs> Making lots of money? Being popular? Loved, appreciated? All those are things that we delight ourselves in. 
and in and of themselves they're not evil, wicked things. But our greatest joy, our greatest pleasure and delight should be in the Lord and in the Word of God. Because that's where God is revealed to us through the Scripture. Your law is my delight, he says. Let the proud be ashamed. For they treated me wrongfully with falsehood. Have you ever had somebody lie about you before? You ever had somebody spread gossip and rumor about you? You know what our tendency is when that happens, when maybe somebody has said something about us that's not accurate? Or sometimes what people may do, people can be pretty clever about this, is they might say things about you that are halfway true. But when they talk to others about you, they don't provide the full context. The other side of the story, as we've come to call that. Well, I mean, what do you do when you've been lied about, when you've been mistreated, treated falsely by other people? You can try and retaliate against that. You can do, and probably should do, what the Bible says in Matthew 18. You should go to a brother or sister in Christ privately and work out those differences. We don't do a very good job with that sometimes, but we should do that more often in the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. But ultimately, if that person will not relent in doing whatever it is that they're doing, I, I've thought a lot lately about that, and because the crazy times that we're living in in the world today, remember that serenity prayer? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Some things, beloved, are beyond your control. You give that to God. And God can deal with that. He says, Lord, I've been delighting in your word, but there's these people who have treated me wrongfully. They've attacked me through falsehood. But he says in the midst of that, as they're going out and they're spreading falsehood and lies, here's what I'm going to do. I will meditate on your precepts. They can focus on whatever they want to focus on, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the Word of God. I'm going to focus on the truth of God. You know, sometimes people around you attack you, and they may not even know it, but the devil could be trying to use them to keep you from doing the will of God. You ever thought about that? I've shared with you the story before of Nehemiah, how he had a couple of critics when he went to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. They were standing on the ground and saying, come down from there. You'll never rebuild this wall. You're wasting your time. And he wasn't distracted by that. He just put his hands even greater into the work. And the Bible says, I believe, it was in 52 days they had the walls of Jerusalem complete because the people had a mind to work. Not distracted by all the nonsense around them. Make a covenant with yourself that you're going to delight yourself in the Word of God and not be distracted by all the nonsense and the falsehood and the lies and the gossip and the innuendo that you might have around you. Because the devil loves to get us consumed with that garbage. We need to focus on God and focus on the truth of the Word of God. Number six, you're going through a hard time. Find comfort in those who fear God and the Word of God. Verse 79, what does it say there? Let those who fear you, Lord, turn to me. Your people. Those who know your testimonies. Lord, I want people who fear you and people who know your word to be my companions. And come and turn to me. You know, I bet you found out in your own life that when you're going through a hard time, you may not really feel like that you've got a lot of people around you that can comfort you that you can truly confide in, that truly understand the trial or the problem that you might be going through. But I promise you, if you'll look and think about it a little bit, there are some people around you that love you, and they care about you, and they do want to help bear your burdens. They're going through a hard time. You can bear theirs. You can pray for them. You can help them. You're going through a hard time. They can carry yours. And this is how we operate as brothers and sisters in Christ. We go out there in the world, you know as well as I do, you can go out there on your job, you can get out there in the world, you can feel beat down and discouraged. But there is hope to be found among the people of God. 
There's comfort to be found because we're serving the same Savior. We're inhabited by the same Holy Spirit. We're reading the same book. We've got the same mission. We have all these things in common. I encourage you, if you haven't read it before, read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, where the Bible says we have one Lord, one Spirit, one hope of our calling. All these things that we share in common as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's comfort to be found among the people of God. That's why sometimes I get discouraged when I hear people say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I say, oh, great. Well, what, what local church do you attend? Well, I don't go to church. So you're saying you're trying to do this by yourself. When God saved you, He didn't put you out there on the plains like an old western so that you could live life like you're by yourself. When God saved you, He planted you in the local church made you part of the family of God and put you in the body of Christ. Somebody says, well, I don't have to be in church to worship the Lord. That's true. You can worship from anywhere. But the scripture says that regularly there needs to be time where we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and lift up the name of Jesus and get in the word of God. That's what the Bible says. And if we forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we're going to get discouraged and we're going to go cold and indifferent in our relationship with Christ as we await His return. Find comfort among those that are in the house of God, those who fear God, and those who love the Word of God. And please, whatever you do, don't take comfort, or excuse me, rather, don't take counsel from those that don't care about God and don't know the Scripture. You want to wind up in a mess? Take counsel from somebody that doesn't care about Jesus. You'll find yourself in a mess. Find comfort among the people of God. Number seven, and finally, you're going through a hard time, you need to commit yourself to unconditional obedience. Commit yourself to unconditional obedience. What does he say in verse 80? Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes that I may not be ashamed. Lord, let me be blameless Now, we know that none of us on this side of heaven are going to be sinless. We mess up, we make mistakes every day. But that word that's translated blameless there, it's also used talking about pastors and deacons. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it really means to be above reproach. Lord, let me have a life of integrity. I know I'm a sinner saved only by your grace and I make mistakes, but Lord, I want my testimony, I want my life to be above reproach. I want to commit myself, Father God, to loving you, to loving other people, to knowing the Word of God, to sharing the gospel with those who need to hear about Jesus. That needs to be our life. That needs to be our aim, unconditional obedience. That's the way I wrote it there, and here's why. We like to place conditions on our obedience. Well, you know, Lord, I'll be obedient to you if if it won't make me too unpopular. I'll do what you want me to do, Lord, if it won't cost me too much money. We never say it like this to God, but this is really the way we conduct ourselves. Lord, I'll do what you want me to do as long as it won't inconvenience me. If I don't have to be inconvenienced, if I don't have to have my agenda upset, if I don't have to have my schedule or my checkbook disrupted in some way, then Lord, I'll serve you. That'll be okay. I want to remind you that when God called Abram out of modern-day Iraq, He did not even tell him where he was going. But Abram decided that he wanted to follow God. And so he took a step of faith, and the rest is history. God doesn't want your excuses. He doesn't want you to figure it out. He wants you to be wholly obedient to Him. Remember what Jesus said? We give all this lip service to God in churches in the past. We've sang these songs about, I'm a friend of God, I'm a friend of God. And that can be true of you, and it can be true of me. That we can be friends of God. But you know who Jesus said His friends are? John 14, John 15. Jesus said to His disciples in the last moments of His life, You are my friends. If you do what I command. Not if you put on Sunday best. Not if you walk an aisle. Not if you fill out a commitment card. 
You're my friends if you do whatever I command. Holy, obedient to the Lord, according to the Word of God. 